it is crazy once you step away from it to see like how inundated our society is with uh, <laughs> alcohol, <laughs> man. Because you don't really notice it when you're in it. You just think like, oh yeah, it's casual, and then you step away and you're like, man, like that is just like an everyday thing. And but you know, the difference was, and I always talked with my sponsor about this when I got sober, because I was living in um, D.C. at Catholic University before I got sober, and I had a job at some you know, small boutique speakers bureau marketing firm out there. And, um, it, uh, you know, I told them after I got sober, I was like, you know, I don't understand, like if I'm an alcoholic and so is everybody in Washington, DC, because they go out every day after work to happy hour and just get drunk. And then, you know, blah, blah. And then he nicely reminded me, he goes, yeah, but Hans, they get up and go to work the next day. You would call out of work just to keep drinking. I was like, ah, oh, yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can't avoid that reality. Um, My name is Dooley, and you're listening to The Real You. Thoughts, ideas, and perspectives from the ordinary in all of us. How's everything been with, I know it's startup rebates and everything, but you mentioned shifting um, a little bit mm. of your focus on some stuff, like. Where, where are you on your current current journey with the startup world? And just really in the thick of it right now. So we, yeah, with startup rebates, it's still going. It's taken a little bit of a back seat um, just with the launch of Startup Networks mm -hmm. a couple of weeks back. Um, and so for that, uh, that platform, it is hopefully going to be able to solve the issue of a lot of like funding and also deal deal uh, flow management and also increasing deal flow. So um, keeping the price point for both sides low for founders, it's free uh, for VCs. It's still extremely low compared to a lot of competitors. Um, so anyway, that's kind of where we're at and we're really just right doing a lot of outreach, man. So that's everything from, literally just cold outreach emails to folks who we've never met just letting them know hey this is what we're doing we'd love to demo it for you we feel like it could you know really help you mm -hmm. um to going to events uh webinars i was on the one this morning um i don't know if you caught it, it was two access ventures mm -hmm. um they did about a one hour uh webinar and had uh, so Access Ventures was on, and then also Natty Zola from Matchstick, um, a woman named Serene or Serena uh, from Kickstart Fund out in Utah, um, and then a couple others anyway, but they really dove into some interesting topics for VCs and mm -hmm. just general cultural shifts and everything uh, here in Colorado, and I really appreciate that, but I mean, that's the thing, right, for us, it's like, being young and then also my background having nothing to do with tech yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. just um it's tough man it's tough to break into a new industry especially one that's it's not i don't know it's it's weird because previous industries i've been in one example would be energy and like as soon as you're in that industry with whatever company you're just automatically plugged into all these trade associations. And mm -hmm. so you start hitting all those meetings on a weekly, bi-weekly, monthly mm -hmm. basis. And so you start to pick up like exactly the lay of the land, what's going on, who's who, what all the acronyms stand for. Yeah, you yeah, know? Yeah. So you get a real like crash course in that. And with tech, especially in Colorado, it's just, it's just all over the place, right? So you're yeah. just trying to piece together everything like, oh, wait, yeah, this person is over there. They're doing this. They helped this guy over here like on the Western Slope. And yeah, yeah so it's just really tough to just kind of get everything in one spot. Yeah, and so it's so fast paced too. Like even if you're talking to someone and you're keeping up over the months, but all of a sudden five months later, someone's like, oh yeah, I'm actually on an entirely different project in a different realm now. So, and it's, whoa, whoa, what's, that? what's going on? Um, oh true man <laughs> so true yeah my little sister she just left a company she was working with um i think it was called quit genius they're based out of i want to say sf or new york one of the two mm -hmm. big ones anyway but they're uh like series b or c 
uh, startup. Um, and their whole goal was just to help uh, folks like with addictions um, to mm -hmm. be able to quit like through a virtual landscape mm -hmm. and really cool and admirable. But I mean, she uh, she just was like, OK, like I want to shift, do something else. And she's mm -hmm. coming up at, you know, I'm 30 years old. And yeah, so she's now moving to a different company. And mm -hmm. yeah, it's just it's interesting. Yeah. So what what had you jump into the startup world as opposed to what you were doing previously? And I think I know a little bit about, you mentioned some stuff with like mm -hmm. politics and things like that, but um, I guess a little background on, yeah, what, why make the change into the startup world? Like what? what um, honestly, it was just more of like a, a spiritual intervention, I guess you could put it. Mm -hmm. um, it you know, it's just, it, I had no say in it basically, <laughs> except for, you know, when the phone rang and I answered and took right? So previously, yeah, I mean, it was um, in the energy industry here in Colorado, working with a lot of, um, you know, very big, very powerful uh, firms and oil and gas companies. And I learned pretty quick that that um, it, it was very different than what I was expecting. And so it was interesting. I learned a lot from there. Um, and then after that, I mean, it was just one thing I was running campaigns all over Colorado for, I mean, very local, uh, you know, city county positions in you know, Northern Colorado to, you know, congressional seats down in Southern Colorado. Mm -hmm. And then once pandemic hit, I mean, it was like, yeah, mid-March in 2020. Mm -hmm. And I got a call from my colleague and he was like, yeah, we're shutting down everything. <laughs> I was just like, what? He's like, yeah, we can't, literally, we can't do any more door knocking. We can't hire any more people to go and have mm -hmm. boots on the ground and outreach and all this stuff. So I was like, all right. So that was that. And then yeah. um, honestly, it was just hanging out um, and then getting to a point where uh, finally, you know, a friend of mine called, reached out to me and they were like, hey, do you, we have, a, you know, we know this company is up and coming. Mm -hmm. We'd love for you to at least interview with them as like an operations side um, and partnerships. And um, this guy who I knew for a long time, I mean, he knew my background. Mm -hmm. And so I told him, I was like, I mean, you know, like, <laughs> this is not my side, right? And he was like, yeah, yeah. I was like, okay, just so you know, like going into it, there's no confusion. Um, so anyway, I interviewed for the company I'm at now. And uh, yeah, like next day they reached back out and they're like, we'd love to have you on board. And I was like, oh, okay. So <laughs> yeah, man, it's just been um, yeah. challenge every day since, but incredibly rewarding. Yeah, yeah. What's, um, yeah. how has that affected like um, family relationship and all that sort of stuff? Because I feel like, Personally, as like a young person right now, I have a little bit of that freedom in terms of not having to make all that money and kind of just being completely on my own. Um, if I remember, you do have I don't know, a wife or a, do you have kids or? No kids. Got a wife. We got married last September. And um, <laughs> yeah, thanks. She, she just started working for the state. Um, uh, and then. I have two sisters, uh, older and younger, and then an older brother too. So um, there was that. But yeah, I mean, we always you know, joke just because like my older sister works for um, for Jewel in San Francisco, and then I was working for oil and gas. So we were really covering both ends of the evil spectrum yeah. <laughs> uh, for a little bit. And um, yeah, it was just, you know, for me, it was just, it was, it was weird. I mean, I don't know. For me, I guess that one, I will be honest, like being in oil and gas is so divisive. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of those things where as we stand today, it's a very necessary evil. It's very, you know, one of those things where we need to have it um, mm -hmm. to run everything from this podcast to, mm -hmm. you know, planes flying across country. And um, yeah, so it was the thing I really learned from that one, as much as, you know, I was personally hated in that industry from, you know, going to meetings and people and, you know, people literally following me down the street with cameras, 
just trying to um, aggravate me and get like some sort of response um, to just having really good friends in the industry. I mean, it was just, it was bizarre, but it really taught me a lot of patience and really being understanding of both sides. Right. And so yeah. literally I came out of that, um, that industry with a good balance and middle ground of understanding and saying like, cause I mean, you'd see the far, you know, the far right skies of oil and gas, just loving gung ho, mm -hmm. you know, and we're going to do everything we can to keep oil and gas industry alive. And then you have the far left and, mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of folks who think we should go solar and wind tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And so it's like really just trying to get them like to meet in the middle, like, okay, look, you both have valid points, but like, let's look at what's actually realistic yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and what we can actually do. Cause when you plug your electric car into the wall, that energy does not come from the sun and wind right now it's coming mm -hmm. from oil and gas. So yeah, yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. we need to be able to bridge that and get to a point where we have infrastructure to that, just not at a point where we can do that yeah i feel like that's a huge also kind of like misunderstanding or misconception also like basically i mean the electric vehicle thing's a great example and i can't oh, yeah. too deeply on it but how um it's pointing such in the right direction i think of okay what if we can have this world where we can operate in a more you know start mitigating the need for gas and all that but at the yeah. same time it's it can be almost this marketing play. Like you see all the other car dealers and places um, following after Tesla and it kind of seems, mm -hmm. oh, it's finally happening, but there's still this underlying, like, well, wait, is that, <laughs> yeah. is that solving so, the problem? Yeah, where are we getting that energy thing? from? <laughs> yeah, so is that just shifting the issue to a new yeah. way that it gets consumed under this, like, marketing? Yeah, it's more of like a tangential, like, um, solve that they've that they've done with cars it's like yeah it's a great step but you're still like missing the underlying issue mm -hmm. what we really need to do is to really mitigate the you know the issues around carbon emissions and methane mm -hmm. emissions and until we get to that point like i'd say it, but like electric cars are not going to solve anything long term mm -hmm. yeah so did you did but you anyway, um, so, oh yeah go no, no, go ahead. I was, did you find, because I'm just curious, I've never actually met someone really, I mean, maybe I have, but I just haven't actually talked to someone about working in sort of that industry and maybe some stuff you'd seen. Like from the outside, I think you get this hyper evil picture <laughs> of some whatever executives at a board thinking like, profit, profit, how do we just yeah. pump out as much gas? What was your sort of understanding of where people made decisions based on profit motives versus necessity versus, okay, how do we actually start? You know, we're not just an oil company, we're an energy company. And is that yeah. just bullshit on the front or how did you see people actually like deeply pushing for that? I guess what's your sort of. Yeah. No, that's a all those? Good question. It really covers everything. Cause I mean, there really isn't just one, one angle. And that's what I learned is like, you have people who genuinely care about the environment and about the people um, who work in oil and gas. And then you have the other end of the spectrum too of people in oil and gas who, yeah, legitimately what you're talking about, like just don't care, just, you know, drill as much as you can and pump out as much as you can mm -hmm. and just get as much profit. Um, so it was really interesting to see that dichotomy between those personalities all in one industry. Um, I would say, though, the ones that I sided with the most were the ones who were the boots on the ground doing the community outreach and really mm -hmm. trying to create like resolve around issues mm -hmm. uh, that came up. So that's kind of where my my place was within oil and gas. And I think I just kind of gravitated there naturally just with my my background, my my sense of being and um, and being from Colorado, like mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I was born in Salt Lake City, Utah, but I mean, we moved here when I was about mm, like three years old. Yeah. So yeah. as far as my memory serves, I'm a native. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, so it's one of those things like, look, like, yeah, I understand this energy need, but we also need to be able to make sure we take care of our own community, our own neighbors around Colorado and our, and our land here at the same mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. um, and there really are like good... Uh, 
there really are there are companies <laughs> out there. I'm not gonna say good companies are great, but there are companies out there, you know, I guess who really are focusing on trying to uh, reduce a lot of carbon emissions and um, implementing new tech um, and carbon capture yeah. um, to be able to help facilitate the need of, you know, the demand of people in the US, right? Yeah. And so it is a tough line for them to walk to because like, I get it, it's like, they're they're the ones supplying all the energy we need and then they're also the most hated and it's mm -hmm. just like what do you do you know yeah. it's just such a weird position to be in so um, what what brought you to personally like kind of close the door on that was it just sort of a distaste for the industry like your just personal job or like even before the startup kind of when you were mentioned doing more boots in the ground stuff with some politics or things around here like yeah. Why? Like, why personally leave? Basically, I mean, to be honest, like <laughs> my experience at one of the firms I worked with in that industry, I just did not get along well with, mm -hmm. and um, I was really happy uh, once that ended, and mm -hmm. <laughs> where you know, I legitimately was trying my best at the position just was constantly butting heads with um, upper management. And it, when we finally parted ways, you know, it was just this huge sense of relief that came over me. I was just, I wasn't mad. I was just so happy. I was like, thank you. Cause I've been wanting to get out of it and go to somewhere else um, industry wise mm -hmm. and just kept running into wall after wall. And it was just yeah. really difficult. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of those things where, it's just, um, it's just, you know, I got to that point and then, I don't know, man, it was really, again, it's just that, that spiritual side of it. There's so many times when, um, you know, I don't know. I mean, for me, I think I may have told you, but I'm over 11 years sober and clean now. And it's one of those things where, there's a lot of the, the main saying they use like in a lot of 12 step programs is like, is it odd or is it God? And it's one of those things where for me, it really was like the spiritual like intervention. And it was just saying like, it looked like you're trying to get out, you're doing everything you can, it's, you know, whatever, for whatever reason, you just keep running into a wall. So, you know, the universe was just like, all right, let's, let's shift this. It's not going to look the way you want it to look. Mm -hmm. um you know but we'll get you and put you somewhere else mm -hmm. right and so at that point I was just so ready to move that I just was completely happy and like I said just relieved at that point yeah yeah yeah, yeah. it's kind of just like weight off the shoulders in a way um yeah <laughs> um even if you're comfortable going into that too a little bit like I've had some friends personally go through um some you know with whether it be drug addiction or some certain programs in there um how was that kind of like, like even practices or, or journey kind of from that place where you were before coming out of that? Like, how, how has that been? And now it's, I guess, been years at this point, but um, mm -hmm. I don't know, I guess, what's a little bit of your journey through, through that? Like, did it make you more spiritual? Was it? Um, just, Do you mean just purely in the recovery sense, like through program and all that? I guess, I guess both. Um, I just think career wise. Uh, more, more, I guess recovery and spiritual side of stuff. I feel like maybe you, or yeah. maybe you, whatever, whatever comes to your mind. Essentially, I just don't I haven't really yeah. talked about it before. Yeah, no. Hey, I can talk, you know, uh, <laughs> on end about that one because it's a, such a huge part of my life. Um, I mean, it's one of those things where I don't necessarily ever hide that I'm in recovery, but I also don't like, you know, throw it into just a random combo it's only like once i've been at a point where i'm comfortable with somebody and then if there's a point where i feel like it's you know poignant for me to bring it up i will mm -hmm. um but yeah i never hide it because like you said you've had friends um or folks you know who've gone through that and it's shocking how many times i'll mention something and then um either you know in that same conversation or a day later or a year or two three years later someone will that person will reach back out to me and be like hey so you know 
my sister or my mm -hmm. brother or my friend or myself am going through some stuff and just would love to pick your brain up, you know, and I'm just like, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely mm -hmm. happy to help. Um, so for me, I mean, it was one of those things where I, you know, <laughs> I was a, have a very nice uh, background of German heritage and alcoholic uh, DNA running through me. So <laughs> there was really no avoiding it, unfortunately, <laughs> but it just uh, kicked off when I was about 16. And then I was out for about eight years um, doing that. And then about, it was 20, when I was 24 is when I finally got sober. Mm. And so, I mean, it was just one of those things where you know, it just got to a point where it was just too difficult to keep running that same race anymore. And I finally mm -hmm. just kind of acquiesced and I just had had enough. Mm -hmm. And so um, luckily I had um, or have a brother who's in the program too. And he was in before me. And so he was like, hey, if you want to go to, you know, an A meeting, uh, you know, and this was right after I had just gotten out of, you um, Arapahoe County Jail for uh, getting uh, thrown in there. So they, yeah, they let me out. I just didn't want to face my parents at home because I was at home at the time. And so my brother's like, hey, let's go to a meeting. I was like, yeah, please, just anything not to face my mom and dad <laughs> right now <laughs> would be great. So that's where it started, honestly. And then ever since then, I just stuck with it and <laughs> never looked back um, just because it was such a Oh, such a shit show. <laughs> it was just tiring. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so there's something too, I don't know if it's too kind of personal stuff, but a little bit something I wonder about because we even talked about it with, with my friends too about how habitual um, drinking has just become socially among not just our group, but everyone we know, including myself. Like, yeah. One thing to go out and um, maybe have like extremely reckless uh, behavior from it. But then also there's kind of the underlying like cultural standard that it's like really hard for us to go like the weekdays without drinking even. That's like a little yeah. like, thing we've been doing with our roommates um, where it's like, okay, let's just like Monday through Thursday, can we like not drink this week? And then even that something comes up and it's like, oh, well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's not even like, so oh, man. I guess I'm just kind of wondering like, did is that something like familiar like did it seem like it got like really kind of more on the reckless side or just something like yeah. I'm even keeping an eye on you know knowing it kind of runs in some of my past family and stuff like that like, yeah no I mean it's a good point and the one thing I'll say though about the cultural side of it and social side of it it is it is crazy once you step away from it to see like how inundated our society is with mm -hmm. uh, alcohol, <laughs> man. Cause you don't really notice it when you're in it. You just think like, Oh yeah, it's casual. And then you step away and you're like, man, like that is just like an everyday thing. And, but you know, the difference was, and I always talked with my sponsor about this when I got sober, cause I was living in um, DC at Catholic university before I got sober. And mm -hmm. I had a job at some, you know, small boutique speakers bureau marketing firm out there. And um, it, uh, you know, I told him after I got sober, I was like, you know, I don't understand, like, if I'm an alcoholic, and so is everybody in Washington, DC, because they go out every day after work mm -hmm. to happy hour and just get drunk. And then, you know, blah, blah. And then he nicely reminded me, he goes, yeah, but Hans, they get up and go to work the next day, you would call out of work just to keep mm -hmm. drinking. I was like, ah, oh, yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> yeah. yeah I can't avoid that reality mm -hmm. um but um for me now like it never was a struggle going out um into any social function after getting sober and still isn't today mm -hmm. there's wow. never like any issue and I think the other big one too that a lot of people who do struggle with addiction and alcoholism is that they think you know, they're going to be pressured or mm -hmm. they're going to feel, you know, awkward or anything like that. Honestly, like never, man. Mm -hmm. never have I ever felt that in the 11 years I've been clean sober, um, going out to functions and I don't shy away from it either. Like I'm mm -hmm. constantly trying to find great networking events to meet people at, to socialize, um, going out with friends, uh, to concerts, um, mm -hmm. 
you know, things like that. But it's just, you get to that point where you have such like a, a strong spiritual background that you just are like, yeah, that's, that's fine. They can do that. We know we can't, so we're okay. We'll be yeah, fine. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's no problem with that. Um, but, you know, yeah. as far as you're saying, like with trying to tone it down during weekday, I mean, <laughs> dude, I mean, honestly, oh. like you're nowhere, you're nowhere near to where the point I feel like I was at. So, I mean, if you're, you know, going through a fifth of jack a night and, uh, you know, then you might realize like, okay, might have a problem, man. <laughs> but yeah. yeah, I mean, that was the difference, right? It's like the saying that they have in AA is like, um, I forget this one. It's like, um, oh yeah, one drink is too many and a thousand isn't enough. And that's mm-hmm. the way that we put it. Cause once we pick up, we just never put it down again yeah. um, until something just so catastrophic happens. Mm-hmm. um so yeah i think it's a i think you're okay <laughs> well no it's still a balance though because you know you can you can yeah. easily fall into stuff like sometimes it's all fine until you know it's just keeping a check on it but um right yeah and too so with with kind of the spiritual side like are you religious in in any way you mentioned catholic school stuff yeah like, are you catholic or are you more do you consider yourself spiritual itself or yeah pretty agnostic on it i think to lean towards the most um only because i had like a cool introduction to it when i was younger and then my sponsor now is big into buddhism um that's kind of one that i tend to lean towards the most when it comes to like any type of prayer meditation Mm -hmm. um or just like treatment of other human beings or animals in my life Mm -hmm. um but i mean I don't do any anything at any like temple or go to any retreats. I would like to, but I just really haven't um, gone big into that. I mean, yeah, I was Catholic when I was younger and um, that was just, but here's the thing is like, I never had any qualms about it. Like I had a great, you know, kind of transition into it. Cause like we were born um, Presbyterian and mm-hmm. then, when I was about 11, my dad decided for our entire family, we were going to become convert to Catholicism. <laughs> we're like, okay, cool. Like, <laughs> we don't know. Um, so yeah, we did that. Went through the whole RCIA program. I uh, went to Catholic middle school and then a couple of years at Catholic high school and um, even Catholic college, but that was just for baseball. But the point was, is that um, I had great, great teachers, great priests, Mm -hmm. um in that space and learned a lot and loved them and so I had none bad ever to say about it yeah Uh, yeah I mean you do meet some people especially in like program they call it like recovering Catholics Mm -hmm. um people who just had such like a tough time with it and Mm -hmm. I don't know I mean I can see where any religion can do that to anybody Mm -hmm. if there's like enough pressure put onto them um but yeah, I mean, for me, it was it was very, very welcoming and very easy. And then, like I said, right now, I mean, yeah, I haven't been to like a mass in years. And mm-hmm. but I mean, I just kind of consider the program itself that I do for my sobriety kind mm-hmm. of more of like a spiritual practice, I guess, yeah. in a sense, because it just it kind of covers a lot of bases that we face every day especially like at work, like, what do you do when, you know, things aren't going your way? What do you do when, you know, you F up? What do you do when, you know, you and your colleague are button heads, you know? And it's yeah. just a lot of just understanding and patience and just being able to speak with people. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah. it's just more like a deep practice in that sense. Yeah. 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 I, I love that kind of viewpoint on it too. Cause some, I won't get too into, <laughs> into my thing with it, but similar where it's almost like I, have found a, a level of respect and appreciation for all different religions and that most of them mm-hmm. are coming from a place of, oh no, there's some sort of existence that we can't quite understand. And then there's this kind of identity factor to it, which is like, yeah, how do we live through our own abilities to bring a positive thing, whether it be in some cases for some afterlife, in some cases for the current existence. Um, but the kind of themes of it are where like I connect to in that, the spiritual side is actually just the relationship with yourself. So like you're saying the practices of how do I 
deal with adversity in this way? Am I getting mm-hmm. angry? Am I like blaming someone else? Or am I recognizing that maybe they're just something that wasn't aligned and like different yeah. practices like church, for example, I almost have a kind of a new, I used to hate it all growing up. We'd oh. like do the Catholic thing. <laughs> yeah. I, hate I mean, church. <laughs> yeah, the one caveat I'll say is like, there were countless Sunday masses I went to hungover. So yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. so I used to just like resent it and then kind of now I, I, I think I've come to like a I think having understood meditation a little more is sit like sitting in church you, even if you're like just completely blank out of anything the priest or whatever saying it is just a yeah. spot to come like, be intentional <laughs> for an hour and just sit and like be and so um I think that too is where I kind of connect with stuff is like no one really knows the higher power this ultimate calling stuff and then everyone has their total internal yeah life that they're living that's like spiritual or religion to me it's like that balance of those things and then just the practices you can introduce to kind of bring those forward yeah no i i agree completely and i think here's the thing like i noticed in not only like organized religions but even like within aa Mm -hmm. is that um, if you're going to mass or a meeting for a program or whatever daily or two or three it is, here's the thing is like, yeah, you can go to there and you can sound like you're the most, you know, peaceful Jesus, Gandhi, Buddhist, you know, Muhammad loving, like incredible human being. <laughs> here's the thing, then you get outside and then I'll see people like yelling at a gas station attendant because mm-hmm. they didn't get the correct change back. And I'm like, all right, man, like, here's the thing is like, yeah, you go to that meeting. That's, an, uh, you know, an hour reprieve you have. You still have 23 hours out of the day mm-hmm. that you have to re- you know, like continue to practice that every yeah. day. Yeah, yeah, It yeah. doesn't give you like a, you know, go ahead. And that was like one of the things I will say like with Catholicism that I didn't fully wrap my head around until later in life was that, you know, with confession and like praying the rosary and all that is like, I saw it more as just like, oh, I can continue to be a dick and screw around. And then I just confess something and then like, oh, everything's clean and clear Mm -hmm. and I can go back to it, you know? And then I got to the point I was like, oh, it's about like actually trying to be I'm a better human being so you don't have to keep going back and saying like yeah I did this again priest you know yeah father I've sinned (laughs) yeah exactly (laughs) yeah no yeah I'm I'm totally I'm totally with you I think it's kind of crazy also um like how much weight there's so we've been coming up with some of these kind of questions in terms of some of the pocket change stuff we're doing and also here but one of the questions that um popped up and I was talking with someone about the other day was do you think religion is more unifying or divisive Mm. um and (laughs) there's the side to it which is like okay there's unifying in the way it obviously brings a ton of people together and then there's the clear divisiveness of most war or complete catastrophe of society through history has come from like religious like religion based Mm -hmm like power dynamic and then Mm -hmm. claiming that someone else is going against you but there's also a fine line in there around just the simple politics and greed of i think using religion in the name of something um yeah or like sometimes it just ends up being that there are people who are selfish or maybe don't see the world a certain way and hence do things that to others are perceived as complete evil so um, yeah i mean i would go as far as just to keep it very simple and most almost all wars are just based around like you're different and i don't like it yeah yeah, so yeah we're yeah. gonna fight and it's like that's the dumbest reason yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he's like <Right>. we got <laughs> yeah it's crazy i was gonna say um we so uh um we were watching the a documentary the other day on uh the Rajneesh, like the uh it's called like wild wild country or something but it's basically on uh the cult Dude, stuff. i haven't watched it yet my wife watched it and was blown away but watch it 100 watch, yeah. watch it yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it's just <laughs> but i have an inter- i'm super interested in cults because oh my god everyone everyone yeah. like i mean yeah well you hear cult and you're like oh that's crazy but it's, yeah. it's i mean crazy. hey we get saddled all the time in aa as a cult so i get yeah. it man <laughs> no no but yeah. that's the thing is you you kind of like break it down like at the end of the day a cult is just even a religion or a certain thing you're doing 
kind of is just like a brand in a way that you now associate with like yeah hey these cult people and especially in this example it's like they're coming from a place of they found people who they can connect with it's about like mm-hmm. finding this joy and laughter they're not harming anyone they're not doing the stuff of course once the <laughs> once it got too big and all this other shit then it became kind of same thing in the war the battle of right well, you're different we're different but but heads yeah. but um most cults are not just set up to just be these weird evil things like they're usually a collection of people who finally found peace in being with others who think a certain way but that's what we do all the time everywhere like me picking to go to a certain school is because it comes from a certain set of people who from a certain academic and i assimilate the most with these people yeah 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 Yeah. so everything we do is kind of just a cult or a brand or a affiliation and hence i don't know so i'm interested in cults and the criticism no yeah no it's good i mean it really just i feel like it just comes down to this is my tribe. These are the people I feel the most mm-hmm. comfortable with. Yeah, right. And you just yeah, yeah. don't ever, you, you know, nobody ever wants to feel left out. Right. And mm-hmm. that's what a lot of it comes down to, especially like for me, just being, you know, um, in program now, but like growing up, it's just, I mean, still like today, I'll have the dumbest fears just pop up. Mm-hmm. And if my name isn't like in the right spot on an email to our company, you mm-hmm. know, for a cool, and they don't like me as much oh you know my whole life is done I'm gonna lose a job I'm not gonna have any future everything is just going up in flames and I'm just like well I have to catch myself like Hans that's just the most irrational ridiculous (laughs) yeah no yeah why are you trying to make this something I know I know that's like so I kind of I mean even like even shooting, yeah, shooting, like you're doing a lot of reach out emails, for example, same thing where you kind of just, like, I also get reach out emails from people and it's like, I have no qualms with them as much as it's like, listen, I just don't think this lines up. Like, I don't, you're still living your life and I hope it's great for you, but, um, yeah. but it's interesting because I mean, we do the same shit where, you know, we've been trying to grow some of the stuff on pocket change. And so we're yeah. trying to do some local collaborations or whatever and sometimes people just don't email you back and you're like oh, god i can't ever show my face in that place again I know. No, the rejection know. yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i was just talking with a buddy yesterday over lunch about that and he it was in that same boat of learning like a lot of this <laughs> with any business any industry it's it's a percentage game and yeah. you just can't take it personal and mm-hmm. um honestly like I will say for whatever reason, that's one spot that I'm actually fairly balanced in is I don't take it personally when somebody doesn't follow up or if they, you know, just ghost me or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, I had a guy yesterday who's in uh, a firm in private equity around here who I reached out to just cold to try to connect with uh, for one of our products. And he just sent back to, you know, sent back a simple, like, no thanks. And I was like, Hey man, thank, like, yeah. <laughs> I appreciate you at least just like sending a no thanks. Like yeah. sad that that's gotten to a point where that's a huge deal. And that, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. that's where the bar is at. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, I don't know, man. It's, it really is every day. It's just a battling of fears and just keeping those at bay and just yeah. trying to think logically and rationally. And for me, like one of the best outlets I have for that is just having good um, close friends who mm-hmm. I can reach out to when I do hit some adversity that I don't understand. And a lot of it, I mean, most, you know, I'd say like 90, 95% of all situations mm-hmm. i have set the ball rolling somewhere to make something happen, Mm -hmm. whether positive or negative, but it's when the negative ones happen. And sometimes I'm unsure, like, I don't know my part in this. And so it's really helpful to have good friends who will be honest with you and who won't be biased and who won't co-sign your bullshit. Mm -hmm. And they'll just say, Hey, look, like, did you, did you talk about this person behind their back? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Did they hear about that? Yeah. Okay. So you definitely did set this ball rolling. Yeah. You can see the problem you created. So maybe don't do that and go make an amends to this person for what yeah. you did to them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just set the course right. So mm-hmm. I think a lot of that accountability is what really drives me on a day-to-day is like, 
I'll be honest, like the worst thing I have to do for like program is make amends. Mm -hmm. I fucking hate making them. <laughs> and like just going hat in hand, mm -hmm. telling the person why I was an idiot, what I did, taking sole responsibility of it, telling them I won't do it again. God, man, like I just hate it so much. So a lot of my life mm -hmm. is just trying to find that balance of like, okay, like be who I am, but also at the same time, like, don't do things you're going to have to, you know, regret and make amends for later. And yeah, really yeah, yeah, yeah. Helps so much, whether, you know, whether in person or even online, which, I mean, that's a whole other topic you can go on to yeah, 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 behind yeah. the keyboard and the screen. But mm -hmm. well, that I feel yeah. like is that's growth right there. Like there's this whole something I think about a lot is the, oh, no, just like be yourself. But the mm -hmm. hard part about being yourself because sometimes that's even a hard thing to just like who am i like <laughs> first there's that yeah. like part, but then there's also the <laughs> there's also the but i'm constantly evolving too and so mm -hmm. uh, but i think that's a great way of like recognizing a thing you <laughs> fucking hate is making amends but then also yeah. seeing over the past months or years <laughs> or whatever it's been of hey you know what maybe i've hit a point now where i recognize how to avoid like avoid situations of doing that again of yeah, needing to make amends, but then also seeing yourself as the person you are now, which has then gone gone through these certain challenges and growths and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, that's kind of all just like literally what life is. Is we just kind of make up shit for us to be struggling, not like make it up to be struggling with, but <laughs> life is just a bunch of shit that just kind of gets thrown at mm -hmm. us, and we kind of hold certain weights to them because that's just what we do as as humans. And then as we get past them, that's kind of just that fulfillment and growth, whether it be challenge of starting a startup and putting that challenge in front of us or maybe it is you know yeah. family or addiction or different things um but i don't know it's kind of like the yeah. beauty of life right there <laughs> it really is and i will say the one thing i'd add to that that i've learned is just like um so many times <laughs> when like the points where you get to when maybe you don't like a certain personality trait or like aspect of yourself and you want to change it and you just have tried and tried and tried and just doesn't go away and mm -hmm. there's so many times where I've done that and in like 12 step programs I'll tell you like I think it's like step seven they'll say like you know after you've gone through your four step fifth step blah blah then you like pray this prayer to like remove all the defects of character from me right mm -hmm. and at first I used to think like, oh, it's just like some magical thing. Like I pray it and then it's gone. Right. And then what I started to realize, like, oh, like I actually have to do something different. And that was like, it's so, it's so simple, but for me, man, it just, it just was the most mind boggling thing for me mm -hmm. to I'm like, wait a minute. I actually have to like put an effort to do something different to actually yeah, yeah, change yeah. the personality traits. So I don't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. And it's just, I don't know why that one, even today is still so difficult to me. Like even a perfect example with my wife, like I am a horrible person when I get woken up in the middle of the night, like, dude, man, I am just, I don't know what it is, man. I'm just a dick. And so I, after like snapping at her a couple of times when she wake me up or something. And so I got to a point where I was like, okay, you're right. You know what? I don't know why I do this, but I'm going to figure this out. Yeah. And I, you know, promise to you, I won't do it again. Yeah. And through like a lot of work and trying to figure it out, and I don't really know what like the underlying point of it, uh, like fear, or whatever it is around it. But honestly, just got to a point now where when she wakes me up for whatever reason, like I'm very calm about it. And mm -hmm. I just, I'll like, one thing I'll do like is just kind of like raise my voice a little bit and like speak a little softer and just like yeah, try yeah, to be yeah. more understanding and patient on that side. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like those simple little things that I can do to mm -hmm. show her like, look, it's not you. I don't know why I do this, but I'm going to be better because obviously yeah, nobody yeah. wants to be in a relationship with somebody who <laughs> you can't wake them up without yeah, them yeah, yeah, just yeah. turning into a, you know, a Jekyll and Hyde kind of person. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah so <laughs> that, no that's awesome I feel like that's like exactly it right there is just seeing it happen and then I'm literally imagining you like when she's out of town like setting alarms at 2 a.m to like practice and <laughs> wait for her to go I'm not that going home yeah. yet but yeah <laughs> not a bad one glass of milk or some shit <laughs> <laughs> right. 
man, yeah. I'll just keep like a cookie next to me so I can yeah, wake up, yeah. take a bite, be happy, and then yeah, be like, yeah. all right, proceed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs>